Phyllis, thanks for joining us today. Mike, it's good to be here. It's good yeah. to be here. So my wife's been a longtime admirer of yours. Um, and obviously, uh, being in the coffee industry, it's a small, it's a small industry. Well, yeah. surprisingly, small considering how big it is uh, mm -hmm. from a commodity level. But, um, you know, I'd love to just kind of dive in and hear you talk a little bit about CCRE and the work that the Coffee Coalition is doing uh, for those who are maybe hearing that for the first time. And hopefully you are uh, and, and don't know it very well. It's the Coffee Coalition for Racial Equity. Uh, you can see the sign right there behind her. Uh, developed not too long ago uh, yeah. by her and Candace, and would love to just hear you guys or hear you explain kind of what it is, why you started yeah. it, and yeah. what that looks like. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Michael, for reaching out um, to us to learn about the CCRE, the Coffee Coalition for Racial Equity. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for, I've not had, had a chance to meet you in person or your, your lovely wife. So hopefully we'll get a chance to meet. We're physically not located too far from each other. Um, the Coffee Coalition for Racial Equity was started, um, during the pandemic. Well, I guess we're still sort of in it, right? Yeah. In 2020, um, I wrote an open letter to the U.S. coffee industry on racism. And even though the title may sound like uh, I'm calling the industry racist, it was a call to action letter. Um, I've worked in coffee for 23 years um, and I, I love the industry. I love what I do in coffee as an importer. My husband and I started BD Imports, a green coffee import company uh, focused on importing specialty coffees out of East Africa. And we've moved into Latin America as well. But what I saw as I kind of progressed through coffee and I had opportunities to, you know, go to different places and do different things, what I, what I saw was a lack of participation by Black Americans. And it gets a bit confusing because, as you know, being in coffee, it's a very multicultural um, product. Um, it's a global industry. So you have everybody sort of there. But when you actually drill down and you look at who's engaged in the decision making um, within our countries, then racial equity doesn't exist in the way that it should. And oftentimes we think that it's a U.S. problem. It's a black and white problem, but it's not. You know, my one of my biggest lessons had to do with um, when I got a chance to travel to El Salvador many years ago. And I, I asked my host that I was riding in the car with why is it that the people out there picking the beans don't physically look like you? And it was an uncomfortable feeling, an uncomfortable question. But uh, he graciously said to me, it's because I'm more European. They're more Mayan. And in that moment, I realized that uh, it doesn't have to be black and white. It is race. It is based on um, racial makeup. And as we know, coffee has, has a strong history in um, racial uh, inequities. So the open letter was basically say, saying, let's do something. I'm not here to just talk about stuff. We all got limited time. Let's, let's actually do something, guys. And uh, it's been a lot of good years working on gender equity. And so it was um, my work through... Um, working with the women that allowed me to, you know, take my business in this direction and working with black farmers in Brazil, but also building a strong organization here, a non-for-profit organization here that's registered in the state of Georgia. And our focus is to just bring greater racial equity, more inclusion into the industry. And we are squarely focused on black individuals because typically, uh, Mike, what happens is you, we talk about inclusion and then we look up and everybody is there, but one group of people. So I, I feel that it's necessary that we focus our attention squarely on bringing in the voices of black Americans and black individuals into decision-making and opportunities into the coffee industry. And we as a whole um, will benefit from that. Um, some of the things that we've been able to Put together in this year, almost a year and a half, assembled a board of 16 people, come from very diverse backgrounds, 
um, many different countries. I, I can't recall, but I think out of the board members, there's probably 15 different languages that are spoken. Uh, people that identify all different genders, um, races. Um, the one thing I learned is that this isn't one group of people's problems. This is our challenge that we have to solve. So um, we have an education committee, um, finance, fundraising, um, marketing. Um, yeah, we, we got a lot going on. So we launched a scholarship program. We gave scholarships um, to two Black Americans and two Black Brazilians who had interest in expanding their coffee knowledge. Uh, the Donye Ivone Scholarship, named after a prominent um, hidden figure in coffee, a woman, a Black woman who researched coffee at the Coffee Research Institute in Brazil for 65 years, and I got a chance to meet her. But we don't have a lot of, we don't have enough, and we don't have hardly any heroes that are recognized and, and that we can look to to say, oh, okay, so there's a prominent person who has done something in coffee. And um, you know, participation and having, um, you know, visibility is so important. Um, we have a mentorship program that's uh, gonna be rolled out uh, in the next coming weeks. Um, we've partnered with Norman, Norman Cafe Group, um, a um, green coffee trading company for internship positions in their laboratory. So we're looking at um, research. You know, there's, there's a lot of programs that we're working on, um, a lot of work that's happening, a lot of volunteers, over 30 companies have engaged with us to donate, <laughs> excuse me, and over Let's see, we've had 35 volunteers who have, I'm sorry, my dogs are, are fighting. <laughs> we've had over 35 volunteers who've um, <clears throat> come to, you know, come in on Zoom calls and then left the calls and did real work um, to move this work forward. So. It's, it is our work. It's work that is near and dear to my heart. Um, it's work that gives me joy. It's work that brings pain, but it, it really is our work. So I'll stop there. Yeah, no, that's good. I There's a lot of different directions I'd love to take it and kind of elaborate on, but I kind of want to ask the question of like, why does it matter? And you kind of touched on representation. Mm -hmm. From your end, you've been doing this 23 years. You've probably seen a, a, a change in the industry to some degree, but like, why does it matter? Why does representation matter? Why is it your work? What is What does that mean? And what's the goal? Yeah, it matters for several reasons. When I think about it from an industry perspective, it matters to us, for folks who have businesses, for folks who are um, in the industry, for consumers, because it's the same with gender equity. You you are you're not getting a full representation of what everyone can bring to the table because because I've lived a different life. I've had different experiences, and it's not to say all people of one race have experienced the exact same things. That's not what I'm saying. But we have had different experiences based on race, and we have had different experiences based on gender. And when we can bring those different experiences to the table, it's hard to imagine what they can be because we don't actively look at doing that. When you have a, a group of folks sitting around the table, they don't sit there and think, well, I wonder what the women would decide. Well, I wonder what you know this group of people would decide. They're, we're only in our own heads. But what I've found is when I'm sitting around a table and everyone is the same, there's very little representation. We all tend to think alike. We all, because we've had the same sort of life experiences as adults. So we don't have a different background to pull from. So as an industry, we stand to benefit, right? Um, black and brown people are creative individuals. You know, our, our struggle, our lives have been different. Um, we've created, things, we've created something out of nothing, right? And 
we need that sort of energy, power, uh, interest in the industry to fuel it further. Um, coffee has uh, really provided me and my family with a lot, um, not just materialistically, but relationships. You know, um, from the ritual in the morning of consuming the coffee to knowing, visiting farmers to, you know, negotiating and, and, and actually running a business. It has given to me in ways that I can never give back. It's a fulfilling career. You know that. I don't, I don't have to tell you. You love roasting coffee, I can tell. Um, you live your life through your business. It has given me life lessons. Everyone deserves that. Everyone deserves an opportunity to be a part of something that they feel like that they can put their stamp on. And coffee is that. It is, it is this mechanism that it's almost like it has no form until the individual touches it. And then it recreates into whatever masterpiece you inject into it. And I, I see black and brown creativity ingesting itself into coffee in ways that we've not experienced. So for self-fulfillment, career advancement, it's a $225 billion industry with jobs, opportunities, livelihoods, um, travel, you name it. So there's, there's a lot of reasons why this work is important. Um, yeah. No, that's awesome. I mean, so we've had the phrase coffee for the curious for a while. Okay. We really, uh, we really took that term curious uh, over the last six, 12 months and defined it a little bit further. Like, what does it mean for us as a company to truly be curious? And what does it mean for us to uh, uh, instill or bring out curiosity and nuance in our consumers and people who genuinely want to learn because they're curious? And I can't help but think about one of the main ways that that happens is experiencing people mm -hmm. and who they are, where they came from. And I, I think also a lot of times of how like we forget about the different intersections of like, okay, it's not about, I don't see color. It's not about this. Like, well, you know what? Like I grew up with, with uh, a, a black kid in, in Forsyth County who arguably was middle-class like me and dressed a lot like me, but you know what? I didn't experience the minority experience of being the only black kid in my class and so i can look at that and go like oh he's a lot like me and in reality just his experience of being minority was complete well now what about we add in a whole new nuance of a black community that grew up in compton or uh Vinny, one of my dear friends who worked for us for two years who was in prison for a long time so like there's these nuances of like what people bring to the table and how we grow as people that I think what everything you're saying is what we kind of unintentionally did with hiring because we did it more out of like, Oh, we need to hire diversity. Right. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But it was after the fact that we learned all the things and went, Oh my gosh, like uh -huh. everything that this has been teaching us to where now it's not just hiring diversity. It's way deeper than that. And understanding why we do it. Cause now we could talk all day even about like markets and what some of those people brought to the company and how they 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 came up with the idea. I want to introduce coffee with a wrap label and reach a market that has never had an opportunity to buy specialty coffee. So we say, oh, that that demographic doesn't buy specialty coffee. Well, why? <laughs> Is there yeah. a reason why they don't buy specialty? Maybe because they never had anyone actually try. So mm -hmm. and, and reach them where they would feel uh, most received by. So right. uh, mm -hmm. no, I love it. I love everything you're saying. And and for those listening. Um, Coffee Coalition for Racial Equity is actually our uh, giving partner for this month. Um, so all the proceeds and sales uh, percentage of those uh, from this month will be going to them because we've experienced in just a glimmer of, of why they do the work. And so we're really passionate about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm curious. 2018, I think it was, you were on a panel Oh, I don't know. If, I don't know if it was Rico, mm -hmm. 
But there was one moment. I mean, there was a lot of one-liners. I loved it. It was so good. But there was one moment where you, you spoke for a few minutes. And it sounded like you might have gotten a standing ovation. But you talked about hire us. Hire. Um, yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. Um, you know, we talk about things sometimes as if um, it's someone else's problem or that we can't do anything about it, or that um, I just hire the the right people, right? And it may not be hire someone to work in your company, but hire someone as as a supplier to your company. Hire your marketing efforts. Engage in some sort of way, because just like you said, that you started out with this plan of hiring diversity, but what you realize, you're building a different kind of company that, um, that you could appreciate and that others could appreciate. And so what, what I was trying to say, I think it was in Seattle at um, a RICO, the Specialty Coffee Association RICO. Um, what I was trying to say is we need an opportunity to see what coffee really is, not at the lowest level, not in the, you know, the lowest form, but we need an opportunity to fall in love with coffee, right? To fall in love with what it offers. So hire us in those opportunities where we can express ourselves so we can give back to the industry, where we can give back to, you know, um, the beverage. Um, so I think that's what I meant is don't just don't see this as an opportunity that's for someone else. You act, you do something. And it sounds like um, you actually um, did something. And I, I'm very happy to hear that, that, you know, you're building a team of diverse folks. Um, yeah. And I, I can only imagine the conversations, uh, the enlightenment that you go home with, um, because you can look at, you talked about your, your grade school friend, a friend who grew up in your neighborhood, and you can believe that your lives are the same, um, but you're missing out if you don't fully engage with someone. And there's the good, the bad, and the ugly, but not to fully understand someone else's life and what they have to offer you. Um, you're missing out. I think it was James Baldwin who said um, in one of his speeches as he wrote, he was talking about race and he's, he says that um, the black person has looked at you and the person often who is the minority is looking and analyzing the situation. So oftentimes your friend probably looked at you, but there were some things you probably missed about him because Maybe he was trying to conform to the neighborhood, to the environment, to be liked. Um, but when we can fully look at each other as human beings, that's when we grow. You had mentioned Forsyth County, and uh, I did a little research on Forsyth County, and I know that there was a, quite a bit of kind of racial unrest there back in 1987 when Oprah Winfrey did a, a live show there, because... Um, it's a place where people wanted to keep it white. Um, and you grew up there and here I you are I in Tennessee. I, <laughs> well, we, yeah, we moved there only 10 years uh, after that staring uh, with Oprah. And I like vaguely remember being a kid and like adults cracking jokes about the signs at the edge of the county. I don't really remember, but like kind of, it's like there. But what I do remember is, yeah, out of a, class of 200 and a high school of five uh there was two black kids one in my class and never once thought of it never once thought of it and i think this is what's interesting about my background is like my parents are the least like likely to promote any sort of a, a, a intentional objective racism but mm -hmm. that's where we have to grow is when we realize that our implicit biases yes. still impact us. And so as I 
left the nest and moved to Atlanta and went, whoa, <laughs> there was all these black people. And you start to learn things about them and culture and, and way more in the last few years as I've desired that more than back then even. But it's like, oh, I like I had a whole understanding based off of the way I was raised, even though it was nothing negative about black people. It didn't matter. It was about yeah. the lack thereof. It was about, I mean, it's about you know, what, what books did my mom get me at the library when I was growing up? And you know, now we go to the library with our kids and we go, hey guys, pick out 10 books each and, you know, make sure half of them have uh, uh, characters that don't look like, you, you know, like yeah. just learn about culture. They'll pick a book yeah. that's like, uh about the holiday holy out of india and it's got you know indian yeah. culture so that impacted me and it took you know years of peeling back that understanding um and i think yeah. that's one thing that makes me passionate is people get all defensive especially oh, white people but it's not about we're, we're not saying you're a racist you're not we're not saying you're putting on a, a kkk uh a sheet over your head but what we're saying is there's things that you do not fully grasp. There's things you don't understand. There's things that as much as you want to claim you don't see color, you still impact yeah. the way our culture shifts, the way policies are made, and the way that ultimately our democracy, which is supposed to be representative of all people, is right. negatively impacting people of color. Um, so that, I mean, and that's where for us, it started as diversity out of principle, right? Oh, we're going to be that company that hires diversity and look at us, you know? And it, I, I, I'm not going to say that we were like, want, we didn't want the recognition, but we felt we wanted to do that. But then it turned into, this is so much more. And what does it mean to actually like, you know, I, I think oftentimes about like, we spend all this time looking for cost of goods and savings on our margin, right? Like I'm a, I'll research for hours on cups or something like that. It's like, but if I need to hire someone, I post the same two or three places. Well, to those two or three places, are they representative even of a certain demographic of people? Maybe right. pretty exclusively. Do we right. dare dig even a little deeper on the connections to organizations or people of how we hire as much as yeah. we are in saving costs? And I think it's those kind of practices that if businesses and capitalism can try better at, do better at, right. then representation can yeah. happen. So, um, right. agree. I, I'm really enjoying hearing um, a lot of things that you're saying. It is truly a journey. It's a journey. Um, I, I heard someone say once, um, I've been cured of racism, and I thought, <laughs> Mm, that's interesting, but it's a journey. It's a journey for all of us to constantly um, look at our environment and think about, you know, our basic practices that have been handed down to us that um, we're all impacted by. You're not just impacted by it because you're white. I'm also impacted by it. Um, and my thoughts are, are, are geared in a way that, that upholds white supremacy and, and believe that um, white people have the answers. And, and that's baked in, that's baked in from the time I was a child and what I saw. And like you said, your, your parents didn't you know, preach racism or you know, anything like that, but sometimes it's the lack of awareness, like you say, that can cause the most harm. And then you're, you're thinking, well, there is tr truly, if there had been a problem with race, my folks would have talked about it, um, which can be even more damaging for you because it was, it was ignored, totally ignored. You know, um, I always give this example. I stole it from my husband. And he talks about having, you know, a handful of colored marbles and dropping them on the floor. You know, all the blue marbles will not go to one spot and all the, the marbles will not separate by color. Um, but why is it that we're OK with environments that are totally separated by color? And we feel as though we can just put a good reason behind it um, and keep stepping. I do want to talk about how how coffee connects to this because a lot of that folks will say, <laughs> yeah, right. A lot of people will say, what are you talking about racism for? I just want yeah. a cup of coffee. Yeah. Well, you know, good old racism, you know, is probably the reason why um, 
you know, it's probably a good reason why coffee has proliferated around the world in the way that it has. Say, how far back do we want to go? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I had the great pleasure of speaking at the African Fine Coffees Association Conference, and I talked about the West Africans that were taken to Latin America to start the production of coffee in the Americas and in Brazil. And what's funny is that some of my African coffee friends were like, mm, we never thought about that, or we never considered that. But I think if you're going to engage with something that seems so simple, but yet complex as coffee, the least we can do as consumers, as business owners, is understand the roots of it. Because understanding the roots of coffee, the, the history of coffee, really gives us a clear, clear picture on where we are today, where we are today. Um, yeah, and until we're willing to look at that, until we're, we're willing to look at the past, um, there's absolutely nothing we can do about the future. And yeah. so, yeah. I, I think oftentimes, so <laughs> we're only six years old, we're not an old company. And, you know, if we're being really honest, it's like, we didn't know what we were doing. I just liked coffee. And yeah, like I was a go-getter that said, well, if I'm going to do this, let me go all the way. Let me, let me get my SC certification. Let me, let me, let me learn everything I can. But it was all coffee folks. Right. And that was fine. That's what I had to do. And that's, well, that's what we did. Um, and as, as you get into anything, what, no matter what industry, it's like you start to maybe have a little more free time to go, okay, what are the other components? Okay, as you mentioned, coffee is very communal. There's people, there's many hands along this chain, which I knew back then, but never really understood now. And it's fascinating to me because the deeper I get in the rabbit hole of supply chain issues in mm. terms of price paid, in terms of, of margin increase with our consumption increase in the West versus mm -hmm. stagnation of, of pricing in other places. It's funny because I keep coming, coming back to certain things and there's a few people doing some really cool work and I'm so honored to have relationships with them. But one thing I keep coming back to is like, why is there so little content and education about these things? There's, there's some books and there's yeah. a few decent documentaries, but like, why? Why is it for a multi-billion dollar, one of the highest trade commodities yeah. in an apparently growing specialty market, where's all these this education? And right. I, I, I keep coming back to this, like, it, 25, 30 years now, we've been putting, theoretically, we've been putting names and things on the bags, you know, starting with counterculture, intelligence, you stump town, stuff like that. But now it's like, okay, guys, come on, like, let's move past that. Like, those are good things. We need to talk about that. But like, that's a given. Man, where's the education? Like, where's the talk about colonialism? How did it spread from this to this? this, this, this? Where's the conversation about Yemen just like totally being 0.1% of production when it used to be like right. way over 90% or whatever, you know? Um, and, but it's cool to see people doing the work. But I'm starting to see, okay, Michael, if you're in this, it's going to be a while. Like, just commit because it's going to, yeah. it, it's years yeah. of just like patience and yeah. putting out education, putting out content, building relationships. Um, but I think that's why people like you, I, I love seeing the work because it's like, uh, well, Candace said it, if I, if I can use her, she called me out in one of our meetings and she said, I didn't choose, this. I don't choose this. Yeah. I have to do this yeah. and that really hit me in a, in a, in a yeah. good way I was just like yeah yeah like yeah we're in this for the long haul. what does that mean what does it mean to just not feel like we're going to change the world overnight you know we're not going right. to like change the industry in a year right. um so yeah uh, I don't know maybe that was just my soapbox but no uh, I I enjoyed that I I truly enjoyed that um yeah we have it's an evolution over time. Uh, when I first came to coffee years ago, um, there was not a lot of talk about colonization. That's very recent. Um, it was coffee has a dark history. And that one word, dark, was pretty much it. 
Yeah. Um, you know, forget the fact that it was responsible for and currently is responsible for, you know, the industry that we enjoy. Uh, it was just a, a couple words, but then we would go and be able to name the missionaries and the, the kings and everyone else who, you know, touched the bean. But uh, very little contribution to the people who had um, given up so much for the coffee. And it, I think over time, you have the right idea to engage yourself with it and find the space where you are to thrive. Um, for me, you know, as, as a Black woman, I, I worked on women issues, not Black women issues, women issues, because um, Black women were not uh, engaged in coffee so much, not Black people in general in the U.S., um, not at the, not at, you know, attending the SCA. It's not to say that um, Black people weren't involved, but it wasn't at a more visible level for me. Um, and then moving from that into Black issues and having that site allowed me to develop a program in Brazil to identify and to import coffees from black producers because out of the 20 years that I've been in coffee and traveling um, to Brazil and around the world, you know, I never sat on the stage with a prominent Brazilian black person who talked about coffee. And I'm thinking, how can that be? How can that be? You know, considering how Brazil started in coffee it, and, and considering the fact that um, black people are in the majority of Brazil. How can it possibly not be? And uh, so we imported a container of specialty coffee in 2020 and the country um, talked about it. It's been the folks that we, the farmers we work with are, are celebrities. Um, and it's, it's great, but it's also an indictment, right? They've been here for years. Black people have, have built the industry. We just went in and, and saw them. So sometimes things uh, are hiding in plain sight for us, issues. Um, they may come across your mind, but you, if you choose not to do anything and keep stepping, then nothing ever happens. But if you stop and back up and say, wait a minute, let's see, what do we have here? Because in years to come, I have no doubt, I'll be able to travel to Brazil and these families will have their own resorts. They'll have, they'll have the same things I've seen in other parts of Latin America um, for generational uh, farming families. So it comes down to opportunity and it comes down to seeing people, you know, where they are um, and acknowledging them, acknowledging their work. There's so much in it for me if I acknowledge you and we think that that's not the case, but, but it really is. Um, and not in a condescending or look at me, I'm, I'm the hero for these right. people. That's not it. Um, their lives as our lives have a lot of value. And as, as we can figure out how to engage in a way so that we can share the value in an equitable way, versus taking advantage of, um, then I think we'll be in a better place. But uh, I think the industry is headed in a good, in a good direction. I do. You, you give me hope. There's a lot of awesome people in it. Um, yeah. and it is. It is. I, I agree. I think there's some good stuff happening. Um, I, I kind of, I don't know, maybe if you don't mind, let's step back and for those listening, because I want to make sure if people are listening, maybe they don't know a lot about the industry. They don't know a lot about CCRE or mm -hmm. who you are, but like what, when you, you, you say the term equity, it's in your title, but also you are talking about equitable practices. So what does that mean for you as a black person in the industry? What is it? What does it mean for say, even me as, as a, a white owner to yeah. create equitable practices? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a huge, huge word. And I'm going to tell you what I've personally learned about the word equity and about the work of equity. It doesn't always feel good for everybody who is trying to engage. 
because it feels unfair. Equality means that we all get the same things. We all get the same things. But how can we all get the same things if our past if our past has been quite different, quite different. We show up at the same table and we pretend to have gotten there, you know, and we're all here now and nothing else matters. But that is not true. I've served on boards where I stayed in the hotel down the street where my counterparts flew their private jets in, right? Because I couldn't afford to stay at the hotel that was three, $400 a night. So yes, we all had our own space at the table. We had our minds, but we, we arrived there. And even in that moment had different things, had different assets or not. So equity means that you're giving enough in both areas so that it can feel that you're at a point where you can both give, right? Because if you give everybody the same, the person who's had less either will not be able to withstand, won't be able to make it, will drop out, will not serve, right? What if I said, I can't, I mean, I have a small company. I can't, I can't go to these board meetings. I can't do these things. Right. So equity does isn't the same for everybody because it life hasn't been the same for everybody and that it hasn't been that way, not just for the last six months or last year. It hasn't been that way for generations. Right. Um, I have my grandfather's picture on my wall in my office and he had zero years of education, zero years of education. Right. Some of my friends that I went to Harvard with, their grandfathers went to Harvard. That's going to put us at different spots in life. So equity kind of takes that into consideration. And when I say that equity doesn't feel good, I'm saying that equity doesn't feel good because it feels like someone is getting privilege over me? What do you mean? You're taking away from me. And that's, that's ignorance. That's ignorance of looking at the past. That's ignorance of trying to understand why is it that no matter where I go and what I do, I'm still in an environment that is all of one people. And you think that that's just okay. And that's just the way it is. It's, it's, um, it's ignorance. And, and I, I don't know how else to, how else to say it is willful ignorance. Um, because nothing else in society would happen in that way. Right. And we have to start to examine why we're comfortable with that. And what is it that keeps us from trying to change that? And to change that requires thinking in a more equitable way. Like you said, to not just, you know, spend 16 days, you know, sourcing the right cup, but put your one ad in a couple places and get the same people who show up and you just hire one and say, well, I, I hire the right people, right? You have to put the work in. And that's what equity means is putting the work in to find what you need to build a society, to build a company, to build programs. There's equity in everything. People tend to like to ask, well, what can I do? It's in everything. It's in your decision-making. It's how you view life. You know, when you start to see it, you cannot see it, right? right? In basic, simple decisions, it's there. Right. I can I can make a decision in my office that will cut out half the people who would otherwise apply. Right. But if I try to make a different decision, it would be more inclusive. So I think that's definitely like the starting point. I'm another big word for us this last year alongside curious was nuance. And mm. ultimately, if you want to be equitable, if you want to or learn what that means, I think starting places 
how to look at life with nuance, how to look at people with nuance, because yeah. that's scary. And I, I understand why people are like really hesitant about that because you have to essentially pull down the walls of your worldview. Like mm -hmm. your belief religiously, for example, might say, this is how I see people mm -hmm. in this way. Well, then you're never going to see them with nuance, which means you're going to have a hard time being equitable towards them. Um, and so it's scary because you have to, you have to remove some of those lenses of how it, right. I think people feel like if they do that, they're like sacrificing their views, which I don't agree with at all. I think you can see nuance in the world and see someone's way of life, how they were raised, their past, their current situation, addicts, for example, anything like that, or, or hell, someone who is in prison. It's like, do you know anything about the prison system? Do you know anything about the incarceration problem? Right. Do you know anything about the private prison system? Like, and 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 it's not a it's not an attack of like hey you don't know i know it's more like just just learn just ask questions that's all like yeah. here get mad crusade literally came out of the desire mm -hmm. to just learn as yeah. much as we can about these topics and go how can how can we play a small role you know yeah. um yeah. and and i wanted to end something that we started doing i think of this often when we think of equities like what does it mean to have equity management practices in a business? Mm. And I'm a very systems oriented person. So I'm like, okay, three strikes and out. If, if we have a uniform and you come in that third day without your uniform after several talks and write-ups, like you gotta be gone. Or uh, maybe tardiness is a better example. Tardiness is a great example. Okay. Three tardies and you're gone. Like, sorry. And look at me. I'm, I have equality in my business because I treat everyone the same three <laughs> times. You're late. well, <laughs> What happens when you are trying to be diverse and you hire that person mm -hmm. and they don't have a car and they're taking public transit and the bus was late yeah. or, you know, they had right. issues because, you know, because maybe they're trying to share a kid with their, uh, the person they had the kid with. And then there was car trouble. Like I have a car that operates and I never have to think about because it it's a newer car. I, I get that business has to run. I'm the one running it. I, I get it. I have to make hard decisions sometimes, but yeah instead of having some hard, fast rule that says, well, I'm equal or whatever, three strikes, you're out, five strikes, you're out. I, I look at every single situation and go, what was the unique quality? Now, if it's habitual because someone literally has the inability to really commit to something, that's different, right? Right, right. Most of the time, that's not what it is, though. Yeah. It's, it's way different. It's more, it's literal cultural experiential background circumstances wow. that have led to that point. And so, all my managers now, as we're growing and I have managers in different spots, like, hey, guys, do not treat anyone's circumstance as like a check mark in our systems. The system is void because we just need to treat each unique circumstance. And I remember back in the day, I had past staff that would get so upset at me because I'd be, I'd walk outside to have that talk with that same person for the seventh right. time. And right. they'd be like, how could you give And It's like, you don't know shit about what this person's going through, not just presently, but also their yeah. past, you know, yeah. Yeah. ask instead of presume. Anyway, I could talk all day about that stuff. That gets me pumped. But, no, I love that. I um, love what you just said. I love that because we are conditioned to want to actually not be human. What you described, equity is being human. And that's looking at another person and saying, what are your needs? Yeah. And what we want to do is say, I don't care what your needs are. These are the rules right. and follow the rules. And if you can't follow the rules, you're out of here. Think about how many opportunities you've missed out on by just following the rules. Yeah. And yeah, no, totally absolutely. agree. I, I, you, you bless me. You fed me today. <laughs> Well, fellas, for the sake of time, um, I just want to say thank you. We're going to sign up now. For those who are listening, again, go check out Coffee Coalition for Racial Equity. Um, check out BD, Import, uh, BD Imports. Uh, Phyllis is a, a fantastic human being. Please go follow them. Sign up for the newsletters. They have some other cool stuff you can buy coffee from. She has a really great uh, a little like kind of coffee table book uh, about uh, the Brazilian black farmers that she's worked with that you can buy. Uh, so go check her out. And uh, if anything here piqued your interest or gave you even feelings, negative feelings, good. Click on some of the show notes. We're going to have all this listed out. We're going to have her links listed out. And we'll have some other resources listed out to help bring maybe more conversation to your own table. Uh, but of course, reach out, leave a comment if uh, something you want to share or ask. In the meantime, Phyllis, thank you so much. And we'll hopefully talk soon.
Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate this. All right. Cheers. Have a good one. Cheers. Bye-bye. Dead man. Get my priest coffee.